All right, so let us get started. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Debbie McDonald, Jacobs New England Higher Education Market Sector Leader, uh, together with my co-chairs, co Debbie uh, Donna Denio, co-founder of this committee, and Miusha Arndt uh, with Perkins and Will. I welcome you to today's BSA SCUP College and University Roundtable on Campus Resiliency, Flood, Energy, and Cyber. These BSA SCUP sessions are co-sponsored by the Society for College and University Planning and the SCUP North Atlantic Council. We have put together a panel, panel of experts today to discuss some important issues and, and approaches as you plan for resiliency on campus. We have a lot to talk about, so let's get underway. Bruna? Great, thank you, Debbie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruna and I am a civil engineer with Jacobs in our Boston office, specializing in resilient infrastructure projects. Today, we have gathered six subject matter experts to discuss projects and innovations in flood resilience, energy resilience, and cyber security. At the conclusion of their presentations, we will have a moderated Q&A session. So please save your questions until then or write them in the Zoom chat as you think of them and we can address them at the time of the panel. So without further ado, let's get started. So what is resiliency and, and what does it mean really to be resilient, right? So resilience is the ability to survive, adapt, recover and thrive from chronic stresses and acute shocks. Becoming resilient means minimizing the impacts of climate change, extreme weather, natural disasters, urbanization and aging infrastructure, health and cybersecurity threats to name a few, so that people are safe and secure. It also means increasing the capacity of individuals, communities and institutions like colleges and universities to continue to adapt and grow no matter what challenges they experience. Resilience is an attribute of a safer world and it requires planning and adapting ahead of potential hazards. Resilience helps colleges and universities strengthen and safeguard their people, communities and assets, save money, enhance sustainability, fuel growth and secure a more vibrant, prosperous future for generations to come. So let's get started. First, I'll pass it on to Pippa from SCAPE to talk about flood resilience in Boston and beyond. Pippa, I think you're on mute. All right, there, I think I'm off mute. Um, yeah. So Bruna asked me to give a brief introduction to climate resilience planning, specifically flood resilience and risk in Boston. Um, so to reiterate what Bruna said, I really like to think about this in the context of resilience, though I'll focus on flooding. But this idea that resilience isn't just about just about reducing risk um, or, or keeping the water out, but it's what we need to do to survive, adapt, and thrive in the face of the climate change that we face. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about Boston and Boston's resilience planning. Um, I am you know, I have, we have, at, I'm the planning principal at SCAPE, and you can jump to the next slide, Bruno. Um, and uh, we have done a lot of work in Boston, but I think I've also done a lot of work in New York City and around the country. And I think what's really remarkable um, working in Boston is you have a really strong framework um, moving forward at the city level um, for planning for climate change and resilience, particularly flood risk and resilience. So as you are working on campuses and planning in the context of Boston, I think these are really important um, lenses to, to look at and think about as well as resources. So I'm gonna kind of give an overview of, of climate planning. I'll, I'll talk about some neighborhood scale resilience planning work that we did um, to talk about, a little bit about the process and considerations and different strategies for flood risk reduction. Um, and then I will be, um, I'll sort of share just a couple resources. Um, for that you might use in Boston. So, um, you know, while Boston wasn't heavily impacted by Superstorm Sandy, um, many uh, cities in the region started really thinking about coastal flood risk. Um, and if you are walking down in downtown Boston, you've probably seen pictures like that above out on Long Wharf, you know, climate change isn't something that's coming, it's here now. Um, and with the low lying uh, landscape on fill, you know, that was something that Boston needed to think about. And so in 2016, really proactively um, released Climate Ready Boston, began planning and then released. Um, and I think these two quotes really sum it up that this is a, a risk now. And then 
that, you know, the city needs to think about how it can design and adapt for the future. So next slide. Um, a couple things that I think are important about this plan and to resilience, particularly flood risk resilience, flood um, risk reduction and resilience planning in, um, in particular, is thinking about it as layered strategies. So everything that I talk about can be layered on what Doug talks about, can be layered on what the other speakers are talking about, that it's not just one hazard, it's multi-hazard, and thinking about um, how these things are layered together. And that's really built into the framework in Boston, which is wonderful. Next slide. Um, I think the other thing is that there were some very clear strategies laid out in Climate Ready Boston um, that are being implemented now. So these are not just, this is not a plan that sat on the shelf um, and a lot has stemmed from it. Next slide. Um, the other thing is it's gone hand in hand with a lot of work. There's a lot of work that goes side by side, um, the flood planning, and it's really um, in sync with Imagine Boston 2030, the city's long-term vision for the future, um, as well as thinking about resilience, not just from flooding, but from like an equity standpoint um, in Resilient Boston, and a number of guidelines, both at the citywide scale, um, as well as specific um, things that may be useful to you in your day-to-day, -day, like the Climate Resilience Design Guidelines Standards and, and Flood Resilience Design Guidelines. Um, but I think one of the critical um, pitfalls that folks come into when thinking about particularly coastal flood resilience planning is, oh, you know, how do I build a wall? How do I keep the water out? Um, how do I reduce risk? But it's really, we don't want to think about reducing risk and flood risk if we don't know what we're, um, what we're working towards, right? Resilience is about being able to thrive. What is it that you want to achieve to thrive? So having that long-term vision, whether it's for the city of Boston or whether it's for your own campus planning um, is really critical in terms of going through that vulnerability and risk assessment and knowing where you want to go. Next slide. In Boston, one of the key approaches, particularly to coastal, um, coastal resilience was have it looking at things at the citywide after climate ready, but developing neighborhood specific plans that developed specific strategies um, for how uh, for how each one of these at risk vulnerable low lying neighborhoods will adapt um, to climate change, particularly coastal flooding. And I'll, I'll dig in a little bit in more depth on the climate ready Dorchester plan, which SCAPE worked on, um, but I think gives you a lens into the, the process um, and the types of um, analysis and recommendations that all the plans make. So next slide. Um, and those unfolded, like I said, out over, over time. So these are things that are ongoing. Um, plans are done, but they're really living documents. Um, and there's two plans ongoing, which is right now, which are phase two of um, the East Boston and Charlestown plan, if any of you are working in those areas. Next slide. Um, the other thing, and, and we we at SCAPE were really fortunate to work with the city of Boston on, is not just thinking about things in individual neighborhoods, but coming up with a citywide vi vision for resilience on the harbor. Um, and this is a project that we worked um, with the, the, the city uh, environment department and mayor's office um, to really uh, flesh out and realize um, that really tried to depict the shoreline and, and what the city envisioned um, for protecting it, but also making it vibrant in the future. Next slide. And so, uh-oh, hmm, oh. Well, sorry, I missed a slide, slide there, but the, um, the, you know, I think that the issue, the city has, has really gone with, because of the low-lying nature of the coastline, a, you know, a perimeter defense strategy that starts to elevate and harden um, the shoreline. The risk there is always, do you cut the water off? And I think what Boston has really done is really thinking um, about strongly, and as you're working in campuses on waterfront to think about too, is how does, how does flood, def how can flood defense infrastructure integrate and layer with um, ensuring ongoing access to the waterfront, making it more physically resilient, but also making it more socially resilient and, and enabling that long-term access and vibrant waterfront that a city like Boston is so well known for. Um, and that was really a philosophy that we brought to Climate Ready Dorchester um, uh, planning effort um, and something that we really heard again and again from stakeholders. So, you know, going back to what the point that I made about you know, needing to understand risk, but also needing to understand sort of where uh, where you're going, what it is that this, the community wants to thrive, not just what's threatened. Um, when we looked at Dorchester and we spoke with 
uh, community and neighborhood, everyone, people in neighborhoods across the, sorry, in sub neighborhoods across the neighborhood were really interested in getting to and using the waterfront, but it is really cut off from many and most of the neighborhoods by the infrastructure that serves the city, um, by the, the roadways like Morrissey Boulevard, the highway, the commuter rail, the T-line, um, that these provide barriers to the waterfront, barriers that make it hard for people to easily get there, but unfortunately not barriers that keep the water out. There are many flood pathways through openings. So there are often areas of the neighborhood that don't really have a perceptual connection to the, to the harbor, but are still at risk from flooding. Um, and so the, the strategy for Dorchester was really to look at, you know, are there coastal resilience design solutions where we can layer and combine investments in improving access with closing those flood pathways and managing the water around them in order to create a more resilient um, and sh uh, shore. Next slide. So that was really the the um, the philosophy that guided this plan, um, and I think I want to just walk through a little bit of the analysis um, in terms of resources uh, approaches you may think about as you're looking at coastal flood risk um, in in other neighborhoods or in other districts or campuses. Um, but also to kind of understand the planning process that's been used in these neighborhood plans in the context of any organizations or institutions um, that are here. UMass uh, Boston obviously is, is here in, in Dorchester. So this was the, the area, the coastal um, portion of Dorchester. Next slide. Um, next slide. Well, I'll just kind of run through these a little fast because I'm behind. So it's a very varied shoreline from the um, beaches and it's really shaped by the fact that the whole shoreline used to be tidal wetlands so there's a layers of physical and historic analysis next slide um, also kind of understanding the land ownership and infrastructure as well as um, diversity and equity um, and and the demographics of who is able to use the waterfront is a is a really important um, uh, important issue and commitment um, from the city at this juncture next slide um, and so when we talk about flooding, it's important to understand how flooding happens. Um, and in Dorchester, you have sort of low lying areas as well as these narrow flood pathways. Next slide. So as we look at flooding over time, and Brina, you can just kind of flip through these slowly, um, you know, the risk from that that flooding, both daily tidal flooding as well as coastal flooding grows over time. And you can see those inland areas um, with those points of inundation. And so when we did the plan, you know, understanding that resilient strategies needed to combat or overcome these, um, this flooding, we, we divided and su made sub-districts within the neighborhood based on that flood risk. So they were connected by the, the water, by the hydrology, by that flood risk. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, again, going back to that point of needing to know where you're going to, um, there was a huge amount of community outreach and engagement to really establish those goals and priorities that would drive, um, you know, both what we were protecting and how we were protecting, but what we wanted to achieve, the co-benefits to achieve with that. Next slide. Um, go ahead. I'll, I'm running a little behind. So um, it's just a really extensive engagement process. Um, and developed, you know, there's many different adaptation techniques and strategies, and these are some of the ones that we talked with people about, but it's really about pairing them with place, pairing them with those, those goals and priorities and the physical design of the waterfront. So I'll just step through some of the strategies that we used. Next slide. Um, and next slide. Let's do that. So, you know, in some instances, yeah, we can look at the section, it's totally fine. Um, you know, Morrissey Boulevard runs along Dorchester. And so integrating coastal defense with transportation infrastructure, whether that is the roadway or the harbor walk um, with the roadway set behind it. And this is a strategy that's really being used a lot in many of the neighborhoods to think about how we can have enhance that access along and improve multimodal transportation in conjunction with flood risk reduction. Next slide. Sort of moving down to this area of um, Tinian Beach um, and Victory Park, where you had narrow but well loved and utilized parks outboard of the highway, is how to build up and enhance these parks in a way that still provides um, that diverse as access along the water and maybe even new experiences and expands that up with adding and layering boardwalks. So, next slide. 
um, you know, this is a rendering, but what you're walking on is a new multimodal path, but it's also an elevated, um, essentially a levee, um, but preserving that that beach access and that um, those and enhancing tidal wetlands, which can actually help attenuate waves and 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 protect the coastal the new um, the new coastal defense infrastructure. Next slide. Um, so the Climate Ready Dorchester plan was one of the first plans also to look at at you know combining building level add up in in low lying areas combining. Um, lower level protection with building level adaptation and how we would build out strategies for that. So there's are some neighborhoods that are dense and connected to the water and it may be more about what we do at individual buildings and sites. Um, next slide. So you'll see that here. Um, next slide. The other, and you can jump to the next slide, the other, um, you know, the other area at Neponset Circle um, is a point of extreme inundation. And I think this was one of the other plans that really looked at, well, can we or should we be preserving every building and every land use? Is that really the goal? Is that really going to be the, the best, most resilient option? And this is an area where, you know, the preferred option that came out of the plan was, well, you know, if there's one low lying building, maybe remove that, integrate flood defense there, and that is a higher and better use of that space. Um, and so balancing those. And then finally, along the Ponset River, the tidal marsh is a much less, uh, much more lightly settled area. But I think one of the, the, one of the strategies are really about na natural and nature-based strategies. Um, you saw that in some of the other examples through layering, but what's really remarkable um, here is we were working with Woods Hole Group um, to do the coastal modeling and found that, um, next slide, it's sort of shown in diagram, but if we preserve that marsh, rather than letting it drown with sea level rise, if we keep that marsh, if we help it keep up with sea level rise and keep at its relative elevation, we're actually able to reduce the extent of flooding and keep the transit station there from flooding. So this is just to, to highlight that there are longer term, more management, more nature-based strategies um, also that contribute to this. So I hope that gives you both a picture of the process for a neighborhood plan, but also some of the strategies that were applied. Um, and Bruna, I'll just wrap up there. And if there's time after I can share, or you can share the, um, you know, just some of the Boston resources that I'd put in at the end. So thank sure. you. Thank you, Pippa. I'll just go through the next slide slowly and um, Doug, if you want to prepare as I hand it off to you to talk us about a specific flood resilience project in New York. Go ahead, Doug. All right, thanks, Bruna. Yeah, I'm Doug Friend. I'm a project manager with Jacobs in our New York office. I'm currently working on the, uh, the delivery of the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, which I've been working on uh, for the past six years. Um, next slide. So, next slide. Uh, as Pippa alluded to when it came to Boston, uh, it, it cannot be understated how much the effects of uh, Superstorm Standy had on the northeast of the United States, especially uh, New York and uh, other major cities which had, had never um, or hadn't in living memory experienced such an event. Um, when Hurricane Sandy formed uh, in late October, the only I think the uh, remarkable thing was how late in the season the storm had formed. No one in, envisioned that uh, less than a week later, um, the entire thinking of uh, about resiliency um, in the most populated part of this country um, could change so rapidly. Uh, and as we just passed the nine year anniversary for that storm on the 29th, um, as an example, in 2009, uh, in the city's first a resiliency plan, the greener, greater New York, coastal resiliency was barely mentioned. And you know, one of the primary goals uh, when it came to that was ensuring that the FEMA flood insurance rate maps were accurate. Um, that all changed obviously after Hurricane Sandy made landfall. Next slide. Um, and you know, this isn't just as an example, uh, what passed for flood 
planning uh, and preparation. This is a photo which was taken uh, near sunset on October 29th at the Battery, which is the southern tip of New York, where the highest tide uh, in Manhattan was achieved, which was 14 feet above the mean low lower water elevation. Uh, at the time, you know, there was no thought to preparation or any sort of uh, risk mitigation measures be besides uh, layering sandbags at doorways. Um, I mean, this is just place at the end of the Esplanade. It's uh, really just an, an ex exercise in saying that they did something. Uh, next slide. Well, of course, uh, the impacts of Sandy were awful. Uh, 43 New Yorkers, I believe over 90 um, people in New York, New Jersey were died because of uh, Hurricane Sandy. Obviously, there was uh, impacts to hundreds of thousands of residents who were living in the flood zone in New York City. Um, all elements of our transportation system were impacted. Uh, the utility networks, the vulnerabilities to that utility network were uh, made clear when uh, Southern Manhattan was plunged into darkness. Importantly um, of what, why Esker is uh, where it is, the project was select selected, was this uh, highlight about public housing residents. Um, they were particularly hard hit uh, as the public housing uh, generally had been constructed in er areas which were um, closer to the shores uh, in Coney Island, the Lower East Side, uh, in the Bronx, and in the Red Hook, Brooklyn, uh, areas which you know, no, no thought had been given to the vulnerability of those buildings, those people uh, to coastal flood risk. Next slide. So the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, as I mentioned, the city wasn't prepared uh, obviously for the storm nor to make the next steps uh, on what to do. Uh, thankfully, the federal government, uh, which obviously has a lot more experience overseeing um, disaster management and has the, the uh, expertise of people from areas of the country where these types of storms had occurred more frequently, um, launched into an initiative, the Rebuild by Design competition, um, on which I worked with SCAPE on the Living Shorelines. Uh, but the Big U was an idea that was conceived for providing risk reduction from uh, coastal storms um, for the lower half of Manhattan. Um, of that Big U concept, the Eastside Coastal Residency Project was born from uh, the award of uh, $135 million from the government to the New York City for the protection of the Lower East Side, which is shown in the slide to the right. Uh, this is an area, well, this is, includes two bridges, which is between the, the Manhattan and Brooklyn Bridge. And um, the area, which is the darkest blue and the floodplain extends farthest into the, the shore of Manhattan, um, where there is uh, tens of thousands of public housing, vulnerable residents living. Next slide. Uh, this is a view of the flooding along that esplanade in the small photo. Uh, the shore, uh, the floodplain, uh, the dark blue line, the dark blue dashed line, is the current uh, FEMA flood map as of 2013, uh, 2015 when they revised their flood maps in 2013, uh, along with the projected floodplain in the 2050s based on a high level prediction of, of sea level rise of uh, 30 inches uh, over the next 30 plus years. Next slide. Um, as Pippa alluded to, um, you know, understanding risk is an important and what, you're, what risk you're willing to live with or what you're capable of living with, um, whether you need to achieve some sort of defined goal of risk reduction. Oftentimes people, clients, residents jump immediately to the 100 year uh, storm protection, which you know essentially means that there's a 1% chance of a storm of that size occurring in any one year, um, because that's what the FEMA standard is. However, you know that doesn't resiliency doesn't necessarily you know begin or end with the the 100 year storm. Uh, at, for Esker, um, because the city really again did not understand what they could achieve or what they needed to achieve. They officially uh, defined the project goals as a 500 year storm resilience uh, in the 2050s based on sea level rise, which uh, would have meant that a flood system would need to achieve a 
an elevation of plus 20, which is about 12 to 14 feet above the existing grade, um, which is a, a, huge, um, a huge intervention. Um, it was also gonna be very costly. It would never fit within their project budget. So one of the most important parts of our early stages of the, of the ESCA project and working with the city was helping them to understand what they needed, um, the goals of the federal budget or the federal money that was given to the city required that they achieve a hundred year uh, flood resilience and FEMA certification of the system for re um, revision of the flood maps. So in order to get that money from the government, we had to do that. You know, then we have to define what that actually means and how we can make it work, what is achievable in the space that we have, what would mean, uh, what would be best for the, the citizens who are living there. Uh, and eventually we achieved a, um, a system that has a 100 year storm tide design, but also has a resiliency to a 500 year storm event, meaning that a 500 year storm event wouldn't collapse the system uh, or destroy, you know, or it would overtop, but not uh, co cause the collapse of the system. And then we built in some adaptability for um, 100 years from now, being able to, um, to add to the system so that they can, if, they, if sea level rise uh, continues at a pace that they weren't expecting, that they can still achieve that 100 year um, protection level, uh, level of protection. Uh, this is just a, a graphic that demonstrates you know, where we are with the current mean high water elevation uh, in the East River, which is plus 2.28, uh, where and where we need to get to for that FEMA certification of plus 16 um, based on a 30 inch sea level rise in the next 30 plus years. Next slide. Uh, one really, you know, the rebuild by design uh, idea for the Big U um, was for a bridging berm, uh, which would, they defined it as the bridging berm. Uh, not only was it intended to improve the, the resiliency of the neighborhood, uh, but also to improve access to a waterfront park, much like those that Pippa had described, which is um, cut off from the city um, by a highway, um, a six lane highway, uh, the FDR Drive, um, and is only accessible from the north or south at grade level, uh, at the very northern or southern ends of a park that's almost uh, two miles long, uh, or otherwise from non uh, from pedestrian bridges which really don't meet requirements for uh, ADA accessibility uh, for use with pedestrians or bikes. Um, so one of the primary goals uh, was also to improve the ac access to that park, which is the bridging berm is intended to uh, allow for um, larger bridges to, to cross the, the highway um, into the park. Uh, one important element that was overlooked in that idea was the, what the constraints were going to be uh, on building a berm large enough to allow for the bridges to cross over the highway and provide that level of protection um, in a very limited space of a park that's relatively narrow and runs uh, a good way along the the, the river and the highway, uh, while maintaining what was important to the the neighbor the residents of the neighborhood and for the the larger city, um, which this park happens to be uh, the home of uh, many active sports fields: baseball, soccer, track, uh, softball, so and football, etc. Um, you know, in order to maintain those fields while introducing uh, improved access and additional green space. Uh, it turned out the bridging berm uh, was not going to be an option uh, because the, the berm just took up too much space and we didn't have enough uh, uh, land to, to provide everything. So uh, ultimately the plan was, next slide. Uh, the plan became to build a wall uh, generally along the highway, which would be exposed in some areas, but uh, would also be hidden by some, some sloped, um, not quite a bridging berm. However, um, during that entire design process, one aspect that you know, often became overlooked um, was the, the resiliency of the park itself. Um, with a wall or a system in place that provides protection against a, a storm which may occur in, 
of the extent of, of as large or perhaps even larger than Sandy, um, the consideration had not necessarily been given to the impacts of just continued sea level rise without a storm surge event. You know, in a low-lying park along the waterfront of which New York has many and other cities have many, um, the risks from monthly or even weekly inundation with salt water um, really could be a, a huge detriment to the plants uh, and habitat of the park uh, or the usage of the park if drainage becomes a, a long-term issue or a consistent issue. Um, so the resiliency of the park had necessar not necessarily been considered. So after several years of work towards uh, one design, um, the decision was made, wasn't communicated very well, unfortunately, and it's led to some issues with uh, community buy-in uh, to invest in the resiliency of the park itself, which meant the, the reconstruction of the entire waterfront, uh, similar to the um, raised esplanades or raised river walks uh, that were shown in some of the Boston plans, uh, while elevating the park to ensure that the long-term resiliency of these new fields and plantings and trees, um, buildings and other facilities within the park would be, uh, would have reduced risk of more consistent flooding and uh, inundation uh, in the future. So that is uh, currently, um, this is the alignment. Essentially we have uh, at the Southern end of the project, we have a, an exposed flood wall in the black line then we have a buried, the orange line is buried within the elevated park uh, with a river walk to the, to the, to the uh, riverside. Uh, then we come back out above ground and or have an exposed flood wall, which goes to the north, weaving its way past uh, sub, electrical substations and generating stations uh, and several playgrounds um, and eventually tying into a flood protection system, which was uh, built by the Veterans Administration around the VA Medical Center in New York. Next slide. Uh, this is a cross section of what that elevated park, it looks very similar to what uh, Pippa had shown uh, for uh, the Dorchester planning, where we have now an elevated uh, land mass to provide that long-term resiliency um, for this, what is a huge investment in the city. Uh, and ensuring that the residents today um, or in five years when it's finished uh, and in the future get to, to uh, enjoy the, the new facilities. This is just a, a view of the very north end of the park. This is Stuyvesant Cove Park. Uh, currently, um, it's a park with a lot of non-porous surfaces and, and a very intense um, wooded area, uh, which is enjoyed by the residents and, you know, would be uh, integrated within the system. The next slide is a representation of what the park will look like once it's rebuilt. It's reimagined and re-envisioned. We have the, a building which is at the very bottom, uh, the forefront, uh, a new building for a, an ecological organization called Solar One to be constructed and integrated within the system. Uh, new plantings and new pathways while we uh, retain the, uh, the waterfront um, esplanade for those who enjoy the, the activities along the water, fishing and uh, the, for new kayak launch. Uh, next slide. And in the, this particular area is, uh, you know, the plantings and the selection of the design materials uh, take into account that in a coastal storm event of the size of Sandy, there will be inundation and then the system will uh, react and, and thrive again. As, uh, as described by Bruna and, and Pippa. Next. Uh, so some of the, the quick lessons learned, uh, you know, a, a project um, as so, uh, the size and complexity of Esker, uh, you know, there was often a pressure from elected officials who, you know, may not necessarily be in office for the duration of a project, uh, wanting to find solutions and begin, you know, get that shovel in the ground immediately or as quickly as possible. You know, it's really important when it comes to something, a system, whether it be in Boston or New York or any other place where you're talking about impacts, not only the short-term duration of construction, um, but 
you know, impacts and benefits over a hundred years, you know, to make the right decisions, to take the time to get it right, obviously, while balancing, um, you know, the desires of the residents and the politicians to uh, get something done, you know, you really need to take the time to define what you want, what you need, and come up with a system that's going to work. Uh, also, understanding and defining and planning risk catalog, you know, you need to understand what your risk is to sea level rise, what your risk is to coastal storm energy. Now, you know, again, sometimes the that that pendulum swings too swings too far, where coast, Sandy came along, everything was about coastal storm risk. Hurricane Ida comes along and reminds us that there's risks from, uh, you know, historic rain events as well. Uh, and then, yes, you need to address your long-term sea level rise. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Doug. And thank you, Pippa, for that overview on flood resilience. Hopefully you get to um, go on one of those kayaks on my next visit to New York. Next, we'll pass it on to Juan and Roger to talk about energy resilience. Hey, uh, this is Roger Copen. I'm the a principal with Jacobs uh, Energy and Power team. Uh, I sit in Texas with, uh, with Juan. So the story we're going to talk about is a little bit different uh, than we're used to dealing with in Texas. You, we, you think Texas, you want to stay cool and you know, try to keep the air conditioner running. Um, but uh, we had a little bit of an interesting twist this year. And, and Winter Storm Uri, uh, you would think we were up in Antarctica with the way this thing hit us. So, uh, but we did have a good um, you know, case study on, on what worked. And, and Juan and his team at UT Austin, um, who you guys will enjoy listening to, is he, they did a fantastic job. They, for the last 20 years, we've been working at UT to, you know, to really work with Juan to set that system up for resilience, to be robust, and to be able to respond to challenges. So um, you know, the way we do that, if you want to go to the next slide, that it's, it's, it's always looking at the past, you know, what has happened. And we've heard this in, in the other presentations about, you know, what, uh, you know, how do you plan for that? Well, you look in the past, you learn from that, you try to understand where you where you sit today uh, and then and then predict what's gonna happen in the future. And you always have to be responding to what those risks and challenges are. I mean, who would think that that picture on the right, you, you would take that photograph um, in Texas. Uh, that's just, um, you know, shocking and, and, and we had to really deal with some crazy uh, environmental uh, situations here uh, in the electric grid, uh, the, the natural gas infrastructure, the overall, the state was challenged dramatically. And people without power, uh, you know, two thirds to three quarter of the state was without power uh, for, you know, days, three to five days uh, that we were just in the dark. But Juan and his team had a, a fantastic success story. So it's, it's really cool to hear that. Um, going to the next slide, we'll just talk a little bit about framing it. What did it do to the grid and, you know, how did that impact the overall operation? And then Juan can dive in. But, but basically the cause of, of URI was, uh, you know, dramatic shift of Arctic air, air from up north uh, down and in, into Texas. We had single degree uh, temperatures down as far as Brownsville, uh, basically the Mexico border. And it was that way for a week. I mean, we were down super cold uh, and the systems just aren't built for that here. So that causes a, a dramatic increase in the electrical demand uh, for everyone trying to heat their houses and as well as the natural gas infrastructure. We, we are still largely heated and powered by natural gas in Texas. And so it, it drove that dramatic spike uh, in, in power. And the system at the same time was struggling with, with power generation that was freezing uh, and not able to respond. So the, the graph that's on the screen here is a little bit reversed. It's actually showing the generation that was offline relative to availability. So the, the dramatic rise uh, that you see, it, it shows when you know, the, the, the units were tripping, they were freezing. And uh, so you had you know, 52 gigawatts of power unavailable, uh, which is 48% you know, of the entire fleet. And, and the ERCOT demand in Texas was, um, I think the peak is 76 gigawatts. So, I mean, you can kind of get a flavor for that we were in a bad spot. Uh, technically, according to the ERCOT statisticians, we were four minutes and 38 seconds from a statewide power outage that would have lasted for uh, two weeks. You know, they, it, was, it was really going to be catastrophic. But the system did respond. And when we talk of resilience, the ERCOT control system actually did respond and kept the system what was left. 
online and it, it did what it was intended to do, but uh, we, we have to learn from that. So now we're at our, our current present is now looking in the, in, into the past of how do we learn from this event? Uh, and so we're, you know, the ERCOT grid is, is responding. There's a lot of uh, Senate and, and legislative changes that are coming to, to impact um, better performance. But there are things that we can learn from, from Juan and his team and what has worked very, very well. Uh, Juan, I'm going to pass it to you and let you kind of tell us the, the good stuff. Thank you, Roger. So Roger and I have been working together for a long time. So <clears throat> I'd like to say he cut his teeth on some of the things that challenges that we had on campus. So tell a little bit about us. You know, we, we self produce 100% of the energy for the campus. And uh, we, we've actually been doing this for about 90 years. And uh, the campus has been around for about 140. So it's grown a lot since then. Uh, we, uh, we're, we operate a, a, the largest microgrid, some people tell us, in the country, some people say in the world. Uh, so it's, uh, we serve about uh, 20 million square feet, uh, 75,000 people, well, almost like a, we're larger than most cities in Texas. And so uh, our system has, as, a, as Roger said, is a past, present, and a future, right? So our, our original generation and infrastructure for resilience was developed uh, almost 90 years ago. The first tunnels went in like in the 1930s. So we have about nine miles of tunnels underneath the campus. And we use that to send our heating and cooling as long as some other utilities as well. The decision many years ago was made that all of the power distribution to all of our 160 buildings is gonna be underground. So we have all of our electrical distribution, high voltage 12 kV is underground in duct banks. And so the decision made many years ago also was that all the buildings would have resilience built into the infrastructure. In other words, there's two substations in every building to let to chill water connections, to steam connections, and to domestic water connections. We even have a loop that's our own domestic water that we buy from the city. So, so anyway, uh, th there's all of this. And then uh, I've been on campus 25 years. So my job really was to leverage that solid infrastructure and not really mess it up and really prepare us for even better. And so to, to kind of go in the, on the left-hand side, uh, it is a combined cycle system. So we have combustion turbines, a total of 74 megawatts. And we have a, a total of 60 megawatts of steam turbines. So all of our, all of our power, uh, all of our natural gas, uh, it, it's a natural gas driven system. All of our natural gas goes into these two systems. So we take the exhaust heat from the, the jet engines, we make steam with that and that goes to steam turbines. Then we take steam from that and we use that for heating steam to campus. So we send the, Th that through the tunnels. We also have boilers because uh, if I gas turbine trips, which again, uh, those boilers make it up and allow me to keep my steam system going. If I have about nine miles of tunnels, I don't want to lose a steam system. In, in 90 years, the campus has never lost its steam system. And that's essential because if I don't have steam, I cannot produce power. So we're dead in the water until that recovers. So our system is designed so that I also have a connection to the Austin Energy and to the Air Car Grid as through through their uh, a substation. It's a very, yeah, I'm not even going into detail as to how our system is designed, but there's redundancy built into our substation, the redundancy built into our, our loop system for power in the buildings. So if I trip, if something happens on my side on the power side, I can import 25 megawatts. But if I can't, if I don't have, uh, but I can't import steam, so I have to have the boilers. That's what they're for. All of our 30% to 50% of my peak power, which is 60 megawatts, uh, is cooling. So we're focused a lot on really on cooling efficiency. All of our chillers are electric chillers, and we also have a thermal storage system. We have 80, uh, two, about 6 million gallons, about 10 million gallons of thermal storage, two tanks, and it's basically make chill water at night, uh, and use that to offset peaks during the day. So it's, so it's a very convoluted system. Uh, all of the system is one system. Uh, so it's all one steam system. It's all one power system. It's all one chill water system. It's all looped. So it's very challenging to manage this infrastructure and, to, and, and knowing what's happening throughout the buildings. So if we go to the next slide, 
So the key to us to, to our success really is is this microgrid controller. So if you look to that, so you can see there the gray arrow says net zero to the grid. So that's how we operate. Our system is designed so that we don't buy any power, we don't take any, we don't sell any power. We basically just self produce for ourselves. We actually consider ourselves at risk if we're buying power because the grid is less reliable than us. We've only had five outages on campus in 54 years. So that's a, it's a tough thing to, it's a tough standard, uh, but it's driven because of our research focus. We have about $500 million worth of research going on on campus all the time. And so they're spoiled to our performance. We also have, we all, because of the way we design our systems, the way it's designed, it's also very focused on efficiency. You know, our efficiency in, in 2019 was 89% total efficiency. That's total sort of a bot. Electricity, steam to water divided by fuel in. So it's just, it's just very tough to sustain this. So we have, we operate net zero to the grid. We have four transformers that, that allow us to have that interconnection with the grid. So Roger mentioned the issue with the grid that happened during the freeze, and that was very challenging. The, what people don't realize, so if it, we were within a micro, I mean a small portion of hertz of tripping the entire system in the whole state of Texas. We were within like three hundredths of a hertz of actually tripping everything. That's how bad it got in Texas. And uh, so, but our system is designed to protect ourselves. So what happened if, if the grid had, had tripped, in other words, not available. And so we, the, our connection to the grid never left, we stayed. And that's primarily because our system also serves, or the city system that serves us also serves hospitals and high, high risk areas in, in the middle of the city. So they couldn't trip us. Uh, but anyway, we, we assumed that that was gonna go any second and so all of our generation uh, uh, was stayed online. We were fortunate that we kept our, had our most efficient equipment uh, running at the time, most, most resilient, but it's designed for efficiency. We do inlet our cooling to maintain our full capacity on combustion turbines. Our boilers are designed to only, we only produce the amount of steam we need at the campus. We don't overproduce. We only produce the amount of power we need and the only amount of cooling we need. And our system cooling you know, we're, we're really the best in the world in terms of cooling. A typical KW per ton for a chiller in a commercial building is like 1.2. Our average annual efficiency is 0.59. So there's, there's all of these things add up to, that's how we protect our jobs. <laughs> yeah, so I, the dollar they, that I use is the dollar the campus can't use. So all of these things together comprise our, our microgrid controller that delivers electricity, steam, chill water, and hot water to the campus. So, um, it's, so I could talk about this for hours, but I'll, I'll go on to the next thing. To, so what, what happened to us? So if we go to the next slide. So this is something, a data that I just pulled right off of ERCOT. Uh, and you see the two black arrows. So, so I think the important thing to point out here is the orange line is, uh, is net combat gas combined cycle and the blue line is wind. So Texas is known for the amount of wind that it has. I think it's like 25 megawatts of, of wind that's available in Texas. So, so the thing to point out is when wind drops, well, because it's not dispatchable, you can't make the wind blow, the power still got to be available. This is a, a challenge in, in our system. When the wind drops off, you have a low wind day, uh, you got to make it up some, you guys still got to produce the power. So that, the combined cycle responds quicker, and that's the reason why we have combined cycle in our system. We're able to respond quicker to it. But another really key issue here is that uh, everybody is focused on electrification. Now, what I mean by that is, is uh, instead of using natural gas to heat your buildings, the switching to electricity. Northern part of Texas is very electrified for heating. Well, that became a problem. So if you just think about this. Uh, so it's a it's 100 degrees outside. And you're trying to cool your building to 70. That's 30 degrees. If it's zero degrees outside, and you're trying to cool the heat to 70. That's 70 degrees you got to make up. That energy differential is much larger for heating than it is for cooling, and that significantly added to the issues that ERCOT had as well. So, so what happened? You can see right there what happened on right around the end of uh, January is you can see the wind and solar just tanked, basically. And so what, what sur the reason they survived 
is the my cycle went up, and you can look at that gray line. It's actually coal. So coal and natural gas allowed the Texas grid to continue on. So uh, we were hit with this issue. And uh, so if we go to the next slide. So this is how our system reacted. So because of our microgrid controllers and the, and the way we can optimize our system, the, the, the orange line, the orange solid structure you see at the bottom is our cooling demand. Now you wouldn't think that when it's 10 degrees outside that you need to keep cooling going. We have 160 buildings and you've got the way we make chill water and then we send it through coils well, if the water stops to flow through that coil, it's going to freeze. So we had to keep the water flowing. So we're able to drop it from about like 15,000 tons down to like about less, a little bit less than about 4,000 tons is what we went down to. Because of our system, we're able to really uh, go lower it as, as low as possible. The, uh, the, or, the yellowish line in the middle is power. You can see we went from like 25 megawatts down to like 18 megawatts. And that was the lowest we could take it because of our generation equipment. Otherwise, it would have tripped as well. The black line is steam. So we actually hit a historical high in steam and cooling. That was basically heating the buildings. Normally, our winter load is like 25, 200,000 pounds an hour. We were at 350,000 pounds an hour. So that, that was a new historical high. So we were able to sustain. You know, there was a lot of pressure on us from more fronts. Obviously, the weather, uh, water was a really big issue. Uh, because of the freeze, all the water lines around the city were breaking. They actually hit a winter peak, I'm sorry, a summer peak for water use in the summer, in the winter. So that was, they've, they've never had that. We've had issues with freezing before, but not to this extent. So water pressure started to drop, and no one can make energy without water. Uh, and uh, so we we had a, a water pressure as well. It dropped down to like 20 psi. So we were actually within 10 minutes of actually tripping our cooling. So that became a very very key issue. We were scrambling because of our tunnels. We were really insulated, but we still had leaks throughout there. And so the the issue was we need water to protect the buildings. And we have a lot of research going on. Uh, we did have issues in about 30 buildings, but they were minor and nothing really major that that affected anybody. Uh, so there was also a pressure on the natural gas system. The, the gas supplier that provides our gas was pressured. They wanted the gas to be able to heat houses. And so they were forced t telling us, please reduce, please reduce. And we were afraid we were going to get curtailed. Now we buy gas that's, uh, it's, it's firm, so it, they can't curtail us, but they, if it, if they had a major, major enough issue, they would have curtailed us. We were afraid of that. That would have, that would have happened. We would have lost all of our buildings. Uh, other campuses didn't fare as well as us. So we were, because we lowered it, they were happy. We were able to lower the pressure and we kept our system going. So this is how it, this is how, this is what actually happened and how we responded to it. If you go to the next slide. So this is a normal year. This is, was in 2020, a year before. And you can see, yeah, the power was uh, going up and down during the weekends and during the day. And you can see the, the the cooling and steam was much lower. You see, it was peaking at like two, twenty thousand is actually twenty two hundred thousand pounds of steam. So anyway, so it's, this is, was a normal year. That was not what happened. And if you go to the next slide, so why did we succeed? <clears throat> in 2011, we also had a freeze. And and those of you in the north are poo pooing and saying, well, what's the matter with you guys? Can't you guys handle a little bit of cold? Well, we're not used to have, having this kind of cold. And this in 2011, though, we did have a freeze, and that freeze did impact one of our turbines. So we were very we, – we basically designed our stuff, I think, using paranoia. We build it into our system. When we have an issue, we do a root cause, we determine what was it, and we go and we fix it. So we did instrument our lines, and we winterized the heck out of everything we could. So that's – allowed us to survive <clears throat> instrument line insulation heat tracing and we used our most general most uh, reliable equipment so that would help us but we used almost every single contingency i talked to one of my operators and asked him well, how did it go and so he uh he said one everything that we have available to as a contingency we used it all so we were able to optimize our cooling system with a thermal storage 
we had done a very large project, about $5 million project to upgrade our electrical system. And uh, that was completed. That, was, uh, that allowed us to really see what was happening throughout the campus. We were able to manage it. Uh, we could also manage our, if I have a steam turbine and running, if it trips, I have too much steam. I've got to do something with it. Well, we have a system that allows us to deal with excess steam as well. That's called a quench vessel. It, that's another discussion. But our, basically the key is our microcontrollers. So the way it works is if there's an upset, something trips, it kind of keeps everything running and lets everything run. And then the operators or the, the mechanics, people can go out and actually fix it and get it back online. So it allows, it stabilizes it, keeps it going, and then you go and you fix it and you bring it back online. We also have multiple water uh, sources of water. We use domestic water, recovered water. So uh, we, uh, uh, when you cool a building, you're extracting humidity. Well, that water, we don't, most people, it goes down the drain. We don't. We capture it, and we bring it back through our tunnels, and we use it as makeup water in our cooling tower. It's basically free water, and it's, uh, it's not insignificant. It's 60 million gallons a year. So it's, it's a, another source. We also use reclaimed water or purple water pipe uh, from the city. So we had multiple sources, and we were we were scrambling. We were very close to tripping our water, losing our water. We were getting ready to shift water from our basins from one cooling tower to another cooling tower. But I think the real, real reason is we have a very, very strong culture of performance, of high performance. And uh, it's a culture that, that it's, it's been working on for 25 years. And I'll give you just one example. Our operators in the plant, they refused to go home. They had stuff going on in their houses. And they preferred, they slept on the floor in the plants. They would not leave. You cannot tell people to do that. You can't force people to do that. This is what they wanted to do. It's what they did. It's their choice. And so that just goes towards the culture. So, so really, people, people, people is the reason. Yeah, you can have all the whiz-bang toys and turbines and chillers and everything that you have. But people keep it running. And if you don't have the culture, and so it takes a lot. We've, we've, we have, we have a lot of, we built a lot of paranoia into our systems. So we try to think of every potential, potential every contingency. Now, we did have some additional vulnerabilities that we've defined. And we're planning, we're, we're already analyzed them, and we're actually getting ready for the next winter season because I'm afraid this is going to happen again. Uh, Yes, I think Roger has mentioned that ERCOT is trying to fix this, but I'm going to be honest. If we're depending on legislators to fix our problems, it ain't going to work. That's just my philosophy. And so uh, we're CSLs at risk on the grid, and we're, we've always been, we've always seen it as a risk, and so we're just going to defend ourselves and protect ourselves. So that's that's our story. That's the Roger. Awesome. I mean, that's a, that's a great story, Juan, and, and really enjoyed working with you over the years doing this. So, and, and this is not a you know, surprise for anybody on the call, I wouldn't think, but this is kind of the process that Juan and, and, and anyone that's doing this correctly does all the time. It's a continuous do loop. You understand where you're at, you assess where your risks are, your challenges, where your goals are. Uh, you know, kind of coming up with, you know, baseline understanding, and then you evaluate contingencies and alternatives and figuring out the best way to get, uh, you know, build in that resiliency without compromising efficiency. One's a really good example of that. And then you, you find a way to fund it and implement it. And what Juan didn't say is that he, he's done hundreds of millions of dollars of capital improvements on campus, and it's all been funded through efficiency, but at the same time, gaining the benefit of that resilient infrastructure. And it's, a, again, a continuous do loop. And, and we we find ourselves doing this on many of the higher education campuses that we get involved with and, and really, you know, you know, use Juan as a, a good example. He probably doesn't even know how many times we use his name uh, you know, as, as an example. But uh, again, that's that's the end for us. I think I'm going to I'm going to pass it back to uh, the rest of the team. We'll look forward to questions. Thank you, Juan and Roger. That was awesome. I will now pass it on to Adi and Rob, who will talk about our last uh, session here, cybersecurity and cyber resilience. Hey, good afternoon to everybody. I'm Adi Kurisik. I serve as a global technology leader for operational technology cybersecurity. And before we get into slides and all of that, I kind of wanted to kind of just bring up a few things to your attention and then have a little bit of discussion with Rob. 
Uh, you know, Jacobs works with a lot of technology partner, Microsoft being one of them, and we probably have a couple of good stories to share. In terms of my background, I'm a in previous life, I used to be an intelligence officer. So I'll tell you the same thing that I teach to any cyber class around the world. You know, the classes are kind of designed and the presentations are designed to scare you and make you paranoid. But at the same time, this is our life. And with the increase of digital footprint, these are the risks that we're deliberately taking. And, you know, on terms of being paranoid, even paranoid people can have real enemies. So I don't think it's too bad. So let me start by uh, asking Rob actually to introduce himself and then we can have a little bit of discussion about the cybersecurity resiliency. Rob? Yeah, thanks Adi and hello everybody. My name is Rob Curtin. Uh, I'm actually at Microsoft's Burlington, Massachusetts office. So um, very close to the BSA. Uh, I'm in the so to the backstage area of our Microsoft Technology Center. Um, my responsibility is our worldwide higher education team. So I actually report to a Redmond-based organization. Um, so you can joke that I'm a self pole elf. I'm a Microsoft corporate employee who lives on the East Coast, um, which from a higher ed standpoint positions me well um, for the US sort of tendency to lean a little, a little to the East, um, as well as access Latin American, European, um, and really, there's no good way to Asia, so it doesn't matter where I live, um, but, but I do travel to Australia and um, Asia, um, work with customers there. Okay, so Rob, Rob maybe to define the, the scope of the problem here, what is the biggest challenge when you think of cybersecurity and how do we see it in a contemporary uh, educational campus? What do you guys see that as a challenge? Yeah. Um, uh, I think the, the first two sessions were really good, right? Because they, they gave us a sense of very physical, very real geographic threats, right? So there's sort of this epic and seismic shift with climate change. Um, and then you have this concept of consumption and power and, and, and use. And so when you think of the cyber world, I think we need, to, we need to define two things. There's the cyber context, which is, you can't really see it, right? The encroachment is not as visible and scary as the seawall rising. Um, we can't really show what it looks like when the water rises three feet and Tanine Beach spills into Dorchester and Morrissey Boulevard goes away. Um, those are very physical, tangible, kind of hit to the core of Maslow's hierarchy. My, my physical needs are threatened, right? Um, and then you look at consumption base where there's some type of external event that triggers consumption that we didn't plan for. And I think, you know, higher ed experience, that perfect storm in, in both cases, a year ago, March, when we went from in an entity that defined itself um, by, in many cases, the pride of their physical plan, the pride of their wonderful architecture, buildings, traditions, um, libraries, community, and while digital was a complement, physical was the thing. And then all of a sudden, everyone was sent home, home and told to deliver class, conduct class, do research, um, and, and do things in a digital way, obviously because of the pandemic. But as many people point out, you know, these trends were already happening. Um, students were demanding more flexibility faculty were engaging in many collaborative and, and distant in, in engagement. Research was being done in um, various ways. So I, I think that cyber context needs to be um, juxtaposed with and compared with the same type of climate change issues um, that, that have been occurring. And then I, I think there's the higher ed context. And this is where I think it's really important that unlike corporations, right, high, higher ed is simultaneously doing three things that make it really different and super special. So if you're, if you're a university planner, you know, one of the things you have to account for is some of the world's greatest innovation is coming out of our campuses, right? And so you have to enable and support innovation, which is accompanied with academic freedom. And so that brings us to that next point of incubation, where um, certainly in the area of smart buildings, sustainability, Higher ed has been an absolute leader in adopting and, and setting those practices. There's certain technology practices, and in some cases, security 
where higher ed sort of lags and is a late adopter, but there's others where higher ed is an early adopter. Um, and then I think the word inclusion is another area where higher ed um, has always been a good citizen, has reached out to new learner segments, and in many cases um, driven by mission, uh, but reinforced by regulation. Policies for accessibility, inclusion have, have always been on, on higher ed. So there's this, this really great picture of the, the cyber portrait of higher ed and the unique environment of the people who are inside higher ed that, that create both opportunity and real fear. Like what happens if we can't have class? What happens if a nation state encroaches on us? It's not the ocean we can see, um, but we have some of the world's greatest secrets. And we also have some of the most curious and creative people in the world that we've let inside of our network, right? Um, and so we jokingly love to call them students, but in some cases they're faculty, right? They're people with even elevated privileges who think they're doing the right thing or who think they're doing something creative and, and they're unknowingly literally busting the levy down and opening a cyber floodgate where you know, bad actors are able to come in. So yeah, I, I think that that concept of the higher ed community and the vulnerability and breakpoints that happen in so many places, it's kind of why we need to have the resiliency conversation because the physical plant is now really matched by the digital plant um, and how your campus works in a digital way. And now we've blended the two. Right? And I think that's where I'd like to hand it back to you because the challenge is the physical plant has been smart for about a decade now in various degrees of maturity. And so ownership, governance, management between physical plant and IT has really come to a head on most campuses. So uh, let, me, let me take it here, a couple of comments I'll make before we go into the uh, meat and potatoes of the slides itself. Okay. So it, the slide shows the Purdue model, which is some sort of, I would say, not to favor the Purdue University, but the uh, this is the organized model that shows everything that happens in contemporary IT and OT environment. So our areas of attention is everything below the yellow area, which means this, uh, we're not really focused in our solutions. Uh, the, the group that I'm a part of uh, is on protecting your individual PCs and protecting your individual printers. But we're wo worried about your building management systems. We're worried about your smart uh, building control systems, your HVAC controls, your elevators and escalators and so forth. So the lightning, the parking places, the toll collection uh, for parking if applicable and so forth. And all of that is hackable. You, you touched a beautiful point just a little bit ago saying that uh, vulnerability and I, I, I just reviewed this a minute ago. Actually, we have a three tier of vulnerabilities that are predictable that we can expect potential attacks to come from. One is organized nation country sponsored act of cyber attack. And those will happen and, you know, the probes, the attacks, they will happen and they couldn't in include in their target list uh, educational uh, centers. Second is uh, the, the cyber risk that came out of either negligence or lack of training of our regular staff. And then the third element are insider threats. And they're about equally represented through educational community. You know, recently I was asked to consult on a case where somebody hacked an academic organization in an Asian country. And I, I do apologize, I cannot share the the client names, it would be inappropriate. But, uh, and I told them, this is a high school kid. And they say, well, well, what do you think it's a high school kid? How do you know that in five seconds? I say, because they asked for a ransom of $60. If it was an organized crime type of activist effort, they would be asking for hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars, not 60 bucks. So this ability of young brains to actually see a dare and a challenge and, and expose us to risk is really concerning. Next slide, please. Let me uh, address a couple of things here. Uh, 
this is in terms of the services that can be provided, how we see the world. So, you know, our por portfolio of clients covers everything from water, power, to transportation and transit environment, a built environment where all the smart cities and campuses reside, facilities, production, mining, and so forth. Next slide, please. So the one thing is common for everybody, you know, the, the our DHS released uh, an advisory last year that basically summarized, says, listen, guys, these attacks that are happening, you're going to see more of that. And here's the reality of that. The, uh, the reality is very simple. We're not building anything that's not smart anymore. Everything has a digital component and digital component increases the footprint that prospective attacker can, uh, can use to gain access to the facility, no matter how smart we are, no matter how protective we are. Uh, the example I usually use to, to explain this is, we bought a new refrigerator recently. My wife picked a refrigerator and uh, we're both cybersecurity professionals. We have firewalls in our house. We have antiviruses that are updated on every single piece of equipment, but I don't really have an antivirus on my refrigerator operating system that's made by Samsung. Our coffee maker is connecting to internet. Those are becoming our weak points, right? And added complexity of a uh, smart campus where you have buildings that were built through a 30, 40, or 100 years period of time with a variety of building management systems uh, in different age, different technology, and different exposures. And it's a really complex situation. Next slide. Well, I, you know, I, I think I just want to comment on that because while that was a consumer side, you have faculty doing that times 100, right? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. In some of the most advanced research labs. Um, and then you have students, you know, maybe doing it times five, bringing in, you know, any type of consumer device into the dorms. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it does create a unique challenge, which we, we think about physical security and, 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 and greed even, right? And it's one thing to really think about, you know, how do we defend the perimeter of our institution, which has a very clear geofence around it. Um, but there, when you look to secure the digital perimeter, um, you've really got to look at the, the three things that you pointed at, and that is, you know, hey, how do we protect from a malicious and organized attack from an external event? Um, how do we educate people, which is a naivety issue, right? And then how do we make sure we can put the right constraints around internal actors that we may have intentionally um, let inside our building who intentional or not? And, and so I, I think that's, that is higher ed in that cities, defense, corporate, they can act pretty quickly to fire someone or pull someone out or say you must enforce this policy, but getting faculty and students to follow policies they don't agree with, um, that's hard to do. <laughs> they decide they just don't like the policy and that's your problem. Um, and in the name of academic freedom and student freedom, et cetera, um, it, it's a very different challenge. Totally agree. Next slide. So um, here, here is the, in summary, why do we think this is a big deal? Why is this a board level concern? So everybody's getting modernized and digital transformation is uh, touching every aspect of human social uh, life, including our workplaces, education places, our parking places and metro stations, everything is touched by digital transformation. The more digital, the bigger target we become. However, digital is necessary. And, uh, you know, I was in a conference uh, last week with some of my colleagues out of UK, and I was asked the question, the easiest problem then is let's disconnect everything, let's not use internet and we're gonna be safe. And uh, that's not really true. And the reason it's not is, um, it's like protecting the house design against burglary by removing all doors and windows. So, we won't be able to get in or out if we cut the access to technology. We have to manage and control those accesses more than anything else. The bad guys are more motivated today than they were yesterday. They're becoming more destructive. And if you see uh, from the ransomware attack by a high school student of 60 bucks, you know, Texas Department of Transportation paid a lot of uh, 
uh, Oldsmeyer water treatment plant paid a lot. The Colonial Pipeline paid a lot. This is just this year, right? A couple of energy companies paid a lot. So these attacks are repeating and they're asking for more money each time. And our current infrastructure with security operations centers does not have the ability to track infrastructure cybersecurity risk. Next slide. Now, the, uh, uh, what does this mean for, from a business standpoint? One of the biggest issues we have is the inability to correlate cyber risk into some sort of a risk management framework so the executives can understand the seriousness of the potential cyber uh, lack of resiliency. Um, but in, yeah, I, I usually categorize them in three groups, production downtime, whether it's production in a factory or production of education, which means we kill the HVAC and power in all the buildings and you can't hold education, classes or anything, uh, loss of sensitive intellectual property and variety of safety and environmental incidents. In a, in a water company, actually wastewater company in Australia, a dissatisfied worker who got fired retained control of his badges and released 1 million gallons of wastewater into a clean ecosystem out of spite and protests of being fired. This is human. It's predictable and it's, it's preventable. Next slide. The biggest issue we have are so-called IoT or Internet of Things devices who are used to make our life easier. Look, I don't have to punch in my code every single time. I can use a card and then there's a card reader on every door and so forth. You know, these things are convenient, but we buy them because they're cheap, not because they're secure. Nobody knows who made them, what kind of software they're running, and they're typically not protectable. So in order for an uh, organization to be resilient, we need to know what do you have and how we can potentially protect that. Next slide. This is the probably the most important slide and what next to last I believe that I have. And these five bullets is pretty much description of everything we do in terms of cybersecurity and how it works. We can't protect or advise you how to protect what we don't know you have. So on the OT side and IoT side of things, the clients, universities, uh, production plants, utilities, they have no idea how many devices are there on those networks, what state they're in, how, when they were implemented, how, to, how frequently was the software updated, is it properly patched and so forth. So this is the first thing somebody needs to do a detailed asset discovery. Next thing, once you know what your assets are, you can do a risk and vulnerability assessment and try to figure out what, is, what are your weak points and what are those app systems that you cannot, under any circumstances, have an intruder control? From that, you design a threat monitoring, incident response, and threat intelligence buildup that increases your operational efficiencies. And finally, it produces a tools and data that will help you shape your governance model and how to deal with these cyber threats. Hopefully that makes sense. Next slide. There are three types of solutions that are implemented in infrastructure world and in education world. You know, everybody's afraid of the C word, the cloud world, you know, and because uh, people believe if they physically can wrap their hands around the computer that's on campus, that it makes it more protected. Well, here is the news and I have no problem sharing the news. Uh, I understand the resistance and I understand the theory of air gapping and saying, no, it's not a big deal. We can always operate those systems manually. But here comes COVID and you don't have staff to operate the systems manually. Uh, in next 10 years, the, in, the reliance of cloud will be more 10 to 20 times than it is today. However, uh, I don't think majority of our clients are ready to go cloud day one. So what we, what we typically suggest is three different approaches. For those who are very adventurous, who want to go be the, the, the new standard setters, if they want to go cloud, we can help them go to a secure cloud. For those that are not there, they, we can operate all the technology that exists today on-premise, so without data leaving the campus completely, or in a hybrid environment where 
the there is a combination or a hybrid cloud that is protected that they can operate within the campus and its data is contained and and is physically present on campus next slide so how do we do that we got you know as jacobs we're technology agnostic we don't uh, we don't try to uh, advocate for one technology over the other but we have access to some of the best technologies in the market. We invite most of our clients, hey, give it a shot. We'll, we can probably work with our technology partner, like we can work with Rob and get somebody to test some of the new Microsoft solutions. And then you decide if that's something you want to pursue or not. We can be the guys that can help you shape what that offering should look like or what key features it has to have. But the methodology is simple. We got to detect what you have. We got to figure out what the vulnerabilities are. We got to set up a full time 24 7 monitoring, optimize what we do, and set up a new governance. I'm sorry, Rob, if I'm stealing your thunder about the Microsoft piece, but the, you know, the, typically Microsoft was very friendly to us when we, when we introduced the new technology to a different market. And that's all we have. Hey, thank you, Adi and Rob. That, that was fantastic. Now we'll um, open up to questions and I'll pass it on to Andrea to moderate the panel. Thanks, Bruna. And if all of our panelists could um, share their video again. Uh, we don't have a ton of time left, um, so I'll start with uh, just a question for all our panelists so we can each take a step at this. But what is the first what is a good first step you would recommend to campus planners considering improving resilience in the area that you spoke about? So let's start with Pippa. Sorry, I thought my thing was good. Um, I mean, I think one thing is really, um, like I said, knowing knowing where you're going, what what you and your campus need to thrive. I think people first jump to the hazards and the risk. So I think really understanding where you want to be in 50 and 30 and 50 years, then taking an all hazards approach, you may not know everything um, that's going to happen in the future, like climate change. But I think sitting down and thinking critically about, you know, what's out there and then understanding how that could affect, you know, your future vision. And I think it's been good to see in this group, this cross section, like you might be, you know, UMass Boston on the waterfront and be like, oh yeah, sea level rise, that's our risk, you know, but were you, you know, but we're changing and increasingly relying on digital systems as was talked in the last panel. So, you know, it's not always just climate change. It really is change, right? Change in the future in general and, and identifying those risks and integrating it proactively in our planning um, so that we're, you know, we're planning for that vibrant future no matter what. So those are the, those are two things I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Doug? I think we can skip to, to Juan and Roger. Doug had to hop off. Okay, Juan. No, I think that uh, the the question that was raised was how do you do all this stuff? You know, it's it is a lot of stuff. So I, I you know, we have a philosophy. We call it the I cubed um, principle. So it's incremental improvement using innovation. So we have such a complex system. What is the innovation? So there's a a risk, and we actually try actually incentivize risk taking, uh, but we try to take small chunks. We implement it, we check to see if it worked. It worked, fine, go on, what's the next one? We immediately go to the next one. So you're always incrementally improving this. Our system is it's taking 25 years of effort, of blood, sweat, and tears. And so it's, it's, you have to be very persistent, but the most important thing is you gotta start somewhere. I'll just say a quick story. When I used to teach at an institute, and uh, I had a person, I was going to talk about metering. We have a thousand meters in our system on our campus, and so he said, "Well, you know, I can't get my boss to put in one meter." And I said, "Okay, well, tell me, hey, which is your goal for the year? Get your boss to let you put in your first meter." Next year, I saw him again. He had one meter in. He said, "I got my meter in." I said, "Okay, now your next challenge: What are you going to do with the data?" How are you going to use it? You always have to be thinking about, uh, okay, how am I going to move forward? And so that's the key thing in all of this efforts and all of our all of our 
our efforts here that we're talking about is how what is that first step I'm going to take and then how I'm going to build on it. Great. Is, is Roger still on? Yeah, I'm here and, and just awesome. pile on to what Juan just said. Juan also likes to say that if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. And I, I think that's a that's a, a, a powerful thing that, that kind of leads into that continuous process that I talked about is, you know, you, you have to assess where you're at. And if you don't document and, and really understand your systems and you can't identify risks if you don't know what you're starting from. And, and I think that's the key first step is really if you as a campus, you haven't done a, a detailed condition assessment and, uh, you know, knowing you know where your things are in space and, uh, you know, quality and condition, then that's the first step. Great. Adi and Rob. Adi, you're muted. Yeah, I'll, I'll just hop in. Um, I, I think obviously there's, there's wonderful planners here. Uh, cyber is no different than physical in the sense that it, you know, first you have to measure it. You can't improve it if you don't measure it. it it's that concept of it. Right? And I think cyber is becoming a critical part of the brand experience for a university today. Um, and so the sort of governance silos that are facing institutions, I think are, are still clearly split between digital and physical operations when the experience of faculty, community, fans, students um, really don't differentiate between the two. Um, it's the brand of UT, right? Whether I'm in the Rio Grande Valley, or I'm in I'm in Austin. There's there's a brand expectation, and so my my sort of advice to help define it and feed into the IQ process, where it's it's this continuous improvement, is figure out how that experience is delivered both physically and digitally, um, and and what that what that connection is, because somewhere IT physical experience and then campus life have to come to a shared decision. Um, and, and, and maybe for a lot of institutions, that's the hard part is the, the definition of who's in charge and, and who wins the battle is, is not clear when we're talking about devices on a physical plant and then learner or faculty experiences. If I may add on that, Rob, just quick, quick, well, quickly, and I agree with what you're saying. There's IT and there's OT. There's always this discord, let's call it. And uh, so IT guys don't really want to be dealing with OT because we need them 24 seven and they're not used to that function. And so they respond during hours. And so we develop a teamwork partnership with the IT guys. So they're part of our team now. And so we do our own OT, but they they work with us to make sure that, that we're on the same page. So let me offer maybe a couple of perspectives on this. Uh, the, the way, uh, the way I see, uh, how we operate, the way I see how this can work is maybe a little bit different. I agree with everything that was said, but I think there is one more area we're not uh, bringing into the fold. Yes, ITOT convergence is real when it comes to decision-making on this, because somebody, uh, Roger, I believe, said a few minutes ago, uh, or it was you, one it doesn't make a what do you do with the data now when you get from that yeah. meter right so right. that data can be used not necessarily just for to satisfy the functional ot requirements but it can be used in overall campus budgeting and pro projections and you know planning and all of that type of stuff so uh and then you're going to have a natural pushback from it and ot because they once they get sucked in into being a part of this then it's their budget that's going to be used to buy all of these sensors and equipment and systems. So two big issues uh, and points of advice. One is get your workforce trained. One of the biggest points of failure that we're recording is when we set up a system somewhere and we set up IT and OT and we train them. The moment we leave, those guys leave because they get a job offer for extra 20, 30, 50 thousand dollars because the market is hungry for OT cyber people right now. There, there's nobody in the market with OT skills that is looking for a job. So that's one thing. Keep that flow going, keep people trained. And the second thing is look at it from, a, as Rob said, from one brand perspective. Your client doesn't care if the issue was uh, because of IT personnel, OT personnel. They see a problem with their 
with their data access control or something else. Uh, you know, we learn from Department of Defense in how they manage their facilities a lot. And they have combined and merged IT and OT teams. And that works just fine. So that angle is there. We just have to push people towards that angle. And the last point is when you're doing planning, make sure you get your cybersecurity guys on day one to be a part of that planning. Because very often we see that people come with great designs that are just not defendable and not protectable. So if you have them there from the day one, at least they can tell you that's something they can protect or not. Thank you. Thank you, Adia. Yeah, that really and translate thank you. to the phys I just want to say I think that translates to the physical design too. One of the things that we found in campus planning around resilience and green infrastructure is that really having the maintenance and operations teams on board uh, from the outset wants to inform this or your design and how it's going to work, um, but also to do that long-term planning um, because none of these systems and infrastructure, it's not like you design it and you just walk away from it. So I think that's a really good lesson learned across um, all, all of these types of resilience. Exactly. Thank you, Andrea, for, for moderating these questions. I know we would have lots more to say, but our time is up. So we're going to have to close. Uh, and thank you to the presenters, all of you, uh, wonderful insights. Uh, this has been recorded, so if you want to share it with your colleagues, it will be up on the BSA website probably in about a week. Um, thank you all for attending. If you want to look for future BSA events, go to the BSA website, future SCUP events. There's an event this Friday, uh, North Atlantic SCUP, with um, Dr. Paul LeBlanc, president of Southern New Hampshire uh, University, and then a regional SCUP coming up at UMass in person. Uh, in March, and then an in-person SCUP National in Long Beach, uh, still looking for proposals, I think, upcoming for that. Um, but thank you all. Take care and appreciate you all joining. Brad. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So Bruna, I have to jump off because I have a client meeting starting. That's good. Thanks, so, Debbie. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Ed, for the kayaking insights. Appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Came from the heart. <laughs> yeah. All right. And bye, all. Bye-bye.